I'll talk a bit about uh, various strands of work, and this presentation is about 90 slides, which I don't, you know, I'm just going to basically flip through them very quickly, um, but hopefully give you a sense of why I've touched on many different aspects, uh, stemming from audio analysis and visual analysis. Um, I kind of group these two kind of modalities um, together in this kind of audiovisual way of understanding the world. And the way that I approached my research basically in the last seven years is uh, in the hopes of hardware and software catching up to this moment where basically I can put on some type of augmented reality device that understands all the objects in the world um, and can relate my perception of how I view and interact with the world to somebody else and do that for both audition and vision. Uh, and so I've kind of approached that problem through a generative collage-based practice. So uh, building a corpus of how it is that we uh, analyze and understand the world um, using theoretical understanding of how it is that humans actually do that in terms of both vision and, and audition. Um, so starting with that rich theory, going into computation and building the analysis pipelines, understanding um, really that, that really there's a lot missing from the theory when you start to move into computation. Uh, so there's a lot more questions that you have to ask. Uh, and then proceeding to an arts practice, basically, which is the synth synthesis <coughs> component of that work. <clears throat> so I'll talk a bit about that. And lightning speed, here are things that interest me. I'm going to skip that. Uh, <laughs> kind of already mentioned that. More themes, definitely kind of stemming all the different strands of work. Uh, somebody mentioned cybernetics. Definitely that should be up there as well. Um, so this is the kind of breakdown that uh, I mentioned before, going from this theoretical understanding, which basically is how is it that we act and interact in this world? What is it that we're looking at or listening to? Uh, what does the theory say about that? And attention has really been the focal point for that. Uh, in terms of eye movements and EEG and fMRI, trying to understand how it is that we attend to elements in the world. And then moving from there into representation, which is the computational side of things, uh, trying to model that process and see what it is that we're actually representing and uh, how, how is that ongoing experience of the world uh, aided by those representations. And then moving into synthesis, which is more the arts practice side of things. So I'll really pretty much just skip all of this. Eye movements, three to four times a second, we're moving our eyes. How is it that we're able to kind of, um, you know, build this scene understanding uh, over time? The, I've looked at this video, might not play, interesting. I've looked uh, with uh, collaborator, collaborators on how eye movements differ, for instance, in um, autistic and typic typically developing children and use that to inform our understanding. Uh, there's a lot of great work in that, in that space in visual cognition. Um, there are kind of old school models of how attention might work, and uh, I don't think many people believe this model anymore, uh, but this is still a presiding way that uh, visual cognition research had, had progressed for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I think this is mostly obsolete now, but um, this was kind of starting point for attention when I, when I started looking at attention in visual cognition. Uh, we moved into the dynamic domain and by collecting a lot of, uh, with my collaborators, a lot of uh, videos of eye movements, 90 some videos, 200 some participants, really high sample rate um, uh, binocular eye movement recordings. And then looked at all the different, this, this should play, hopefully. So if you've never seen eye movement data before, each, each one of these dots represent a different participant. And this is a kind of model of that, looking at the density of that. Uh, again, a different type of model. And then just another visualization of that model. Uh, so you might be surprised to see how much convergence there is, how much movement there is. Uh, yeah, fun. They're, they're all online. You can go into vimeo.com uh, slash visual cognition. There are some hundred videos of those, uh, of eye movements. Uh, so we looked at all the different kind of standard ways of analyzing visual cognition and attention, looking at all the different visual features that um, 
psychophysical research had, had done, uh, showing, for instance, static features like edges, luminance, color potency, uh, <coughs> goal-oriented filters from seminal research like Hugo and Wiseau. Uh, we looked at all that, and we also looked at dynamic features, like how, how the scene changes over time just by basically doing simple frame differencing as well as using more uh, computationally intense uh, algorithms like image alignment over time or optical flow. Uh, we also look, you know, this is more about the experimental psychology, how we came up with the baseline. Basically, we found that uh, dynamic features were highly predictive of when um, participants were all more or less looking at the same uh, place. So that if you're familiar with exogenous or endogenous sort of intent, attention processes, basically uh, was showing that uh, exogenous features, exogenous attention was uh, highly uh, predicted by these motion features. Uh, so that kind of informed this uh, arts practice and, and trying to develop the synthesis process by basically recreating eye movements and using that to build proto-objects and attention and using those proto-objects in this generative collage practice, which I'll skip over <laughs> entirely. And there were some outputs of that, for instance, um, uh, by doing artistic stylization, which maybe a lot of us are more familiar with, with a lot of the deep learning stuff that's become popularized. But this isn't using deep learning. This is using that sort of um, practice that I mentioned. Uh, and you can read more about that. I'm going to skip over it. Uh, but I think it's important to just kind of gloss over this because it really, um, it really informed the audio side of things where uh, the same process basically was uh, going from attention to representation to synthesis and seeing how it is that uh, we listen, how, what are the representations that we use, and how can I then use that to build a synthesis of that whole process and see what's missing. Uh, so this is just a, I think Chris is there in the back. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so into audio attention, uh, I'm not going to talk about this. This is a slide I stole from somebody. I hope they're not in this room. But basically, cocktail party problem. How is it that we have all these multiple sources of sound kind of basically um, actuating this uh, uh, in, inside of our ear, this kind of monaural source? that we could represent uh, computationally as a, you know, a, sig a, sig a signal. Um, how is it that we're able to then think about the world in terms of this sort of nonlinear track editor view of multiple sources and recover that information? Uh, so that's the kind of interesting problem there. And similarly to the visual cognition domain, there is sort of audio attention models, and they sort of look like this. And you know that's interesting. Uh, but is it really the way that we do it? Um, so similarly with the eye movement literature and trying to understand you know, what, what is it that we're looking at, you can use visual spatial attention to see the differences and the contribution that audio attention is providing by manipulating tasks. So you, you look at a video with audio and you look at a video without audio, look at the difference and hopefully that will inform what is audio um, doing to our visual spatial attention. Um, th this is still all up on that visual cognition Vimeo. You can see a lot of this. There's a lot of research that's come out of this I won't talk about. Um, I also looked at low level features. So this is a lot more abstract. Uh, rather than seeing like high level endogenous sort of things, what, what about a complete mess of stuff which is totally abstract? Um, and this is getting at temporal coherence and things like that, that Shihab Shama and other you know, prominent researchers know much more about. And me. Um, these are some low-level features that I analyze as a result of a lot of those works. Uh, what, what audio features basically are contributing to when participants all look at the same location in a video? And it kind of had the reverse of the visual features where, you know, uh, that old, old chart that I showed you kind of had dynamic features. <coughs> you know, there was a lot of dynamic features happening. And uh, that was indicated by this x-axis, which is representing when participants are all looking at the same location. So we find the opposite effect here. Uh, audio features aren't changing when uh, participants are all looking at the same location. 
so that might indicate basically the auditory object or some particular stream of information that uh, we're all listening to. So that's a kind of constant feature over time rather than, you know, things are different. So that might be, I don't know, that's just all a lot of hand waving, really. Uh, so in terms of representation, now, now that we have like some loose sense of theory and understanding of how it is that we might understand the world, um, how can we start to move to representation? Uh, I looked a lot at ERP literature, event-related potentials, which is basically using EEG, uh, you know, you have this, this cap and you, um, you're measuring electric potential on the scalp and you present the participant um, some, some event many times. You average those events, so this might be three events that have been averaged, and there, there's very well-studied literature for the last 100 years describing these different components to attention uh, and ongoing scene processing. And these are called ERPs, and each one of these ERPs basically, I found, um, provided a computational model that I could then replicate um, to do ongoing auditory scene processing. So this, this was really great for me. Um, I recommend the work of Isfan Winkler, uh, plenty of others to you know, learn more about that. Um, I kind of grouped all of those uh, four, four basic event-related potentials into this sort of model of event detection, segregation, integration, and template matching, which you can read more about in my thesis. Um, and used along with that sort of theoretical framework, um, a computational model, which is source separation, a lot of us are more familiar with. Um, so there's this sort of ongoing scene processing that's able to do segregation, integration, template matching, and principal latent component analysis is one method of performing this sort of segregation. Um, when combined with, say, onset detection, we're able to um, kind of complete the loop of, of this sort of conceptual framework of how it is that we listen. Um, uh, so this is hopefully going to work, but probably not. So here is, here's a complex scene. A lot of auditory sources, things pop out, you know. This is the cocktail party. So what grabs our attention? What's interesting? What, what is it that we're attending to and what, you know, what are the representations that we form while listening to this? Those are the questions that I'm asking. Um, using that kind of conceptual framework and using some source separation, blah, 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 you can, this doesn't sound very good, but you know, it's something. <laughs> so according to this theoretical model and my really bad um, computational model, uh, that would be the things that we're basically um, segregating as background and the things that will foreground, things that we attend to uh, would, be, would be this. You know. And you can, because it's a source separation technique, you can basically add these two sources and you get back the original audio. Okay, so moving into synthesis, uh, I really liked the work of Michael Casey, who I went on to do a postdoc with, and he had this nice little chart uh, which uh, described sound spotting, and uh, there have been lots of different variants of this. Basically, in real time, you're analyzing some sound, you do some segmentation, and you're trying to match what if, whatever it is to some known corpus of sound. And for me, you know, my interests were in perception. How is it that I'm relating ongoing scene perception to things that I've already stored, things that I've already learned about? Um, and how am I creating that corpus in real time? Uh, so I basically just kind of added an arrow there and made this app, which nobody liked, everybody hated. Uh, but you can download it. Um, and it sort of does this whole, it does this sort of thing where in real time, you start with an empty corpus and it's learning sounds, it's adding them to the corpus and it's matching things that it, it hears at any given moment to the things that it's already learned and stored. Uh, so that was an interesting process for me. Um, uh, here's another example of that. It, 
I'm loading up a, uh, an audio file and in real time it's clustering the sounds and I can perform them back as well rather than just listen to it uh, as a matching exercise. So over time it became a lot less about perception and attention and more of a, here's a fun instrument. Give the people what they want, you know. So, uh, here's David Attenborough creeping behind a lyrebird and this I'll try and show, maybe this won't work. All right, well, never mind. Uh, this is probably more interesting for many of you studying archives. So this is an archive of 60 hours of Daphne Orm. Brilliant. Um, I highly recommend you check out Daphne Orm's work if you're not familiar with Daphne Orm. Uh, but basically there was um, some 60 hours of tape reels that had been digitized and researchers of the archive wanted to know uh, what was in the archive. So what you can do is apply source separation to the archive using this sort of machine listening model that's doing event detection, um, trying to find common components uh, or templates of sounds based on that kind of segregation and integration idea. And, and then each of the axes, axes that are uh, drawn here, all 45 have been automatically learned, are basically different timbre profiles, the different sources that it found, although it's, you know, there's also combinations of those, so it's not necessarily true that there's only 45. That's just, you know, one way of analyzing it. Um, and there are much better ways of doing this now, I realize. Okay, so uh, moving into kind of my original aim, which is uh, augmented reality, uh, thinking about sound source and localization, it's really important to keep the idea of spatialization uh, intact. And the first thing that I wanted to do when I first uh, started my PhD in 2010 was to actually uh, build an app called Sonic Graffiti and store the sources of sounds in location based on GPS and relocalize, uh, re-spatialize re those sound, monaural sound sources uh, using this sort of same mashup, cut-up, collage process. Uh, and so there are great ways to do that um, with binauralization. Um, but, you know, I'll skip over all this actually. So yeah, that's pretty much the, the combination of this led to uh, audiovisual smash-ups, which um, basically in real time, uh, sorry, not in, not in real time, but analyzing uh, a video, you can then recreate that video using other content. Uh, and this is work that actually started with Chris Kiefer. Uh, what, what was it called, spam? <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can learn more about that. That's called YouTube Smash Up. Uh, from there, I got really interested in the brain. Uh, I, I wish I had more access to things like fMRI and MEG, because there you can start to understand the actual representations that we are using. Um, so I worked with Michael Casey and did a postdoc uh, with um, using fMRI to understand uh, what encodings we might use to understand music. And my interests were more to do with sound, although he, he was investigating music, so this was a great opportunity to get experience with fMRI and understand more about the brain. Um, so we designed this experiment, um, Jessica Thompson, Bo Sievers, and Michael Casey. Uh, Je Jessica designed the experiment where you have these sort of alternating blocks where, okay, I'll listen to uh, different scales, and then I'll try to imagine them. And there will be ascending and descending blocks. And this is sort of the presentation, uh, the way that we, you were presented in the scanner. <clears throat> and these are the sort of activations that we found in the brain. So, um, you know, no surprises really here, except for maybe the imagined, um, we were using the insular gyrus for some reason. And uh, here's more pretty pictures. And the fun stuff, which was, after having built a model, a computational model, using the known representations, um, you can then decode. So in goes uh, a, a sound source. We look at the brain activations. Uh, we can then use any new brain activation or unseen brain activations to, to imagine uh, with the computational model what they might be listening to or uh, what they might be imagining. And so here are some, you know, 
pretty charts that show that. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>